Our next keynote will take the form of an interview with Jennifer Baker interviewing Max Schrems. That's got to be very <laughs> Okay, well, uh, there's a breakout session later this afternoon, which Max will be in, and he is described as one in a billion, and uh, we're all invited to get to know the man behind the headlines. So, presumably, when you started this, you had no idea you were going to end up making new rules for Europe. No, not at all. Like, um, pretty much the whole Facebook thing started because I was work um, studying in the US for half a year, and there was a guy from Facebook telling us that, uh, basically, the story was you can break European law because nothing ever is ever going to happen, which was really true currently. Um, and that led into a little experiment of, is our law actually enforceable? And um, I never thought it's going to be a big thing. At the beginning, we were just putting facts up on the website. Um, what we got from Facebook, the little complaints in Ireland were drafted over two nights. <laughs> and, uh, um, and suddenly, you're like in this whole privacy debate in the end. I mean, do you ever wish that it wasn't Facebook, that maybe there would have been a different target that might have been easier to... Yeah, go? like, we never expected it to be a public thing, so Facebook is not really a good target for a public thing, because everyone is telling you, 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 you know, you're free to join it, not to join it. So it's really not from a PR standpoint, it was not a wise decision, but it was not a decision, it was just the first one that came up. Um, but it was interesting to see how things are enforceable and where the practical problems are. Because um, we have a nice law in Europe on paper, but we're factually not doing anything about it. And I think that's the big problem in the, pan, tra uh, the, the transatlantic debate is that we're usually pointing at the US saying that's the evil prism empire, um, the Googles and whatever. Um, but the factual problem is that we're not enforcing our law right now. And I wouldn't stick to the law either if it's factually not enforced. Like an island where you get an enforcement notice as like the worst thing that can happen to you, which is a little letter saying, your Facebook, don't do that, kisses your data protection commissioner. That's <laughs> actually what you get there. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, you brought up the Irish data protection commissioner. We spoke a little bit before we came on stage about that. You have uh, some sort of quite interesting views on their efficacy, shall we put it that way? <laughs> yeah. Their independence? Um, I think on the independence is one issue. I think we have a huge problem in practice if it's not after... The DPCs are independent mainly because they also overlook the government. There makes a lot of sense to be independent. And what we saw in practice was that um, the governments are saying it's an independent body, we're not able to intervene, and then they independently put someone there that doesn't do anything. Um, and that's something we see now more and more in different countries. And we had the same problem, for example, in Sweden, where a complaint that we filed was just not ever touched for the reasons that they feel they don't want to touch it. And you have the problem that you don't have any political, um, no, no political responsibility because there is just no government body that's responsible for it. It's an independent office, they can do whatever they want to do. And especially in Ireland, you have the problem that the legal oversight is so expensive that even companies are not going after the DPC. Even if companies get insane rulings, um, the, re the thing I got from most lawyers in Ireland was that even companies are not going after them at the high court and the whole procedure that there is because it's just so insanely expensive. Um, it's even more expensive for a consumer like me. We were able, because there was a lot of, um, a lot of media um, on that, that we had a um, crowdfunding platform where we got about 60,000 euro. But that's an exception. I can do that, but most average users are unable to do that. And that's a problem why, for example, right now at the DPC in Ireland, um, the last numbers from Billy Hawk's time was that um, only two to four percent of all the complaints that were filed with the DPC were actually getting decided. All the others were informally resolved, and I know ours were informally resolved by sending an email back saying we don't do anything. Um, go to the courts if you're unhappy with it. Um, so we have a very serious enforcement problem, and I think that's, that's the thing that hopefully the new regulation is going to help out with as well. Well, of course, if the new regulation uh, goes through in, in its current form, we've got this one-stop shop issue, and mm. Ireland then becomes the center point, and you know, we all laugh about the pictures of that little office in Port Arlington. <laughs> um, but, I mean, what's, I mean, are you alarmed by that? I mean, and in principle, the one-stop shop, I think does that work for you? In principle, the idea of a one-stop shop makes a lot of sense, because as a company, I don't want to have 28 data protection commissioners that have different opinions. Um, that is something that makes a lot of sense. The problem from a consumer perspective is I'm able to speak English, but a lot of the people in other countries have, especially in Europe, have low 
understanding of English, especially if it comes to legal text. So if that is really the only place where you can file a complaint only in the national language, you have a serious problem. And usually in consumer contracts, we have the fact that you can always go to your local court. So the idea of having a cooperation between your local DPC and whoever is the one-stop shop makes a lot of sense. I don't know what the exact um, position right now is in the, in, in the council, and I don't know what the final version is going to be. Um, but I think somewhere along that lines, that is kind of what makes sense a lot. We also had the problem that we have factually in Europe for the big companies in the private sector, two DPCs that are responsible. That's Ireland and Luxembourg for tax reasons. All these companies are, have, are headquartered in these two countries pretty much. Um, and they have a huge burden and they also have a lot of pressure from the public to not scare away the companies you've just attracted by the tax regime. <laughs> um, so there is a certain thing that makes sense that other con uh, countries are also involved in, in the decision process, I guess. Okay. Well, I mean, we sort of talk about, you know, Europe versus Facebook, but can you break it down? I mean, there's sort of three strands to what you're doing. There's the Irish procedure, the ECJ, and then mm. possibly we should talk a little bit more about that, and the class action. So just give us an outline of what direction and what are the next steps with each of yeah. those. Like we had the first, what was the 22 complaints at the DPC, which always sounds like a big number, which is split up every little button on Facebook as an individual complaint to make it easier to process. These 22 complaints were taken back this summer because after three years we're um, at the Irish DPC, we had the problem that we're not allowed to see the evidence. We're not allowed to see um, the files of the case. We're not even allowed to see the counter arguments by Facebook. So it was a two party procedure, but one of the two parties was um, when I sent an email, I got the answer back that they do not respond to the email. If you call them, they tell you that you should send them an email because you're not allowed to talk to you. Um, and they were just totally shutting down. The only option we had was um, filing loads of um, JRs, um, judicial reviews against the Irish DPC, which just didn't pay off. Um, so in the end, we had the problem that, for example, I was talking back then to Gary Davis, the Vice um, Data Protection Commissioner in Ireland, who is now working for Apple, interestingly. Um, but um, the, the fun thing was that I said, you know, I don't know what the Irish procedure is, but under European law, you have access to the files of your case. That's one of the most basic principles ever since even in case law system and like ever there ever since. And the answer, um, I was in at least Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights for a Fair Trial, and the answer from, from him was Article 6 doesn't apply to us. And I was like, Article 6, European Convention of Human Rights doesn't apply to Port Arlington or you know, what, why? Um, and the answer was we don't tell you why. And that was really the point where a friend of mine who was a lawyer as well, um, he was freaked out, like the train ride back to Dublin. He was like, are we somewhere in bloody Boston or what's going on here? Um, so we really had serious doubts um, about the independence or whatever it is in Ireland. We don't have any evidence. I usually leave it up to the journalists to um, make up their mind why that is, but we really saw that they're just not willing to enforce anything. Um, then the second stream was um, the prison complaint, which we filed later, because I got journalists, journalists asking me if the whole prism thing can be legal from a European perspective that Facebook Ireland sends data then to the US, which is then um, used for the prism program. Um, and I was researching it for half a day and I was like, no, <laughs> like factually no, because it runs after Safe Harbor. And Safe Harbor, at least on the legal basis, falls um, under the higher ranking law of Article 7 and 8 of the Charter. Um, and Article 25 of the directive says that there has to be an adequate protection in the US. And I was like, mass surveillance of all my content is surely not an adequate protection. Um, the fun thing was that the Irish DPC first said that they do not have to investigate complaints, so they just don't feel like investigating it. Um, then I'm not a native English speaker, but I was like, according to the o Oxford English Dictionary, Shawl in the law means that you must. That's like as an Austrian speaking here. Um, so they finally decided that they must, but that my complaint was frivolous and vexatious um, because my legal view that this is not an adequate protection was frivolous and vexatious, which allowed them to get rid of the complaint without ever investigating it. Um, and the fun thing was that my frivolous and vexatious legal viewpoint was the same that the Commission has taken, the European Parliament has taken, that the Article 29 Working Group has taken. So apparently, all of these institutions were frivolous and vexatious, according to the Irish DPC. Um, that went then to the High Court and was now referred to um, the ECJ, which I think is going to be a very interesting case. We now, I now roughly know what the different parties are saying. Um, we will go on a head-on collision with Safe Harbor and say Safe Harbor was ever since invalid for 100 reasons. All these reasons we know that are out there because we're the only ones that could ever bring them up to the ECJ. Others will not bring it up. 
Um, another stream of arguments is that Article 3 of the Safe Harbor applies, which allows in specific situations to suspend data flows to individual companies. That's pretty much what a lot of the member states are arguing. Um, the European Parliament argues that um, this cannot be the case, um, but not specifying why. Um, we know that Austria has argued as well, and um, Slovenia, and they're pretty much on, on our side. Um, the Commission seems to try to kind of wind its way out of it. Um, we'll see how that turns out. Um, but it's very interesting because after the Digital Rights Island case, we have a very good case. We can say if um, uh, data retention in Europe, which is only metadata for six months, mm -hmm. is disproportionate, then content data forever is like off the scale. It's not anywhere close to being proportionate. Um, so to overcome that problem will be interesting. I, I really had the trouble that I wanted to come up to the ECJ with a solution to the whole problem as well. That was the reason why I was also in DC and was like, do you have any clue how we can possibly solve the problem? And right now I don't see it. I think um, the, for the ECJ case, there are kind of three options. Either the ECJ finds its way out to kind of find some formal reason not to decide about the thing, which they tend to do if they feel like it. Um, then there is the Article 3 argument, which I think is the most likely outcome, but has a huge problem for a safe harbor in practice, because then every little DPC, which there are 31 countries, plus Germany has like, I think, 16 DPCs or something, every individual DPC can tell you, you're not allowed to bring it to the Google Cloud. And then you have each DPC suspending data flows in all member states, so I think safe harbor in that case would be a Swiss cheese that would need to be fixed right away anyways. And then you have the possibility of a suspension um, of safe harbor in itself, which possibly you can only do by saying there's going to be a transition period of a year or two or something like that, um, which would give the chance to renegotiate it in some way. Um, I think that's the most reasonable things that could possibly come out, but it's the Supreme Court of Europe, so you never really know where um, the end results are going to lay. Um, but that's kind of these streams you see right there. The third thing that we did right now is the class action in Austria, which is kind of coming from the Irish procedure because we decided DPC in Ireland, we're not going to go anywhere with that. Um, and I have the option as a consumer to sue at my home court. Um, classical European consumer law. So we filed a, a, a individual consumer complaint in Vienna. I always wanted to do that right away. And we later decided that in Austria, it's possible to form a class action by assignment. So we have a monetary um, request of damages of 500 bucks in our case um, against Facebook. We try to stay as low as possible to make the point that we're not after money, but about the principle. And um, what you can do is that you assign your monetary claim to the actual claimant that's already there, and thereby form a class action. So it's actually a two-party procedure, um, but you can actually legally represent or factually represent 25,000 people. Um, in our case, that's, um, that was done through an assignment app that was kind of cool. Uh, it wasn't uh, a web app that you could pull on your, on your uh, smartphone and you had to log in with Facebook because we had to verify that you have a Facebook account. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, take a picture of your ID so we verify it's a real person um, and then fill out a couple of forms. It was interesting because um, it took people on average 10 to 15 minutes to fill it out and taking a picture of your ID and uploading it to a web page is really a lot to ask for. Um, and we still had 25,000 people signing up their claim within six days. Then we shut it down because we were like, it's out of proportion. I have to administer it myself because I'm doing that as an individual consumer. Um, I also don't get any money for it because um, I get the same 500 bucks as everybody else is getting. Um, so we stopped with the 25,000. Um, but we got another 50,000 people that just registered to be later joined possibly. Um, so you see how there's a huge kind of um, interest in, in it. And it was interesting because a lot of people even emailed us that they don't want to have their 500 bucks. They want to donate it to someone else. They just want to kind of um, have their rights enforced. Um, we also got the um, response from Facebook last week which was very interesting. Um, they, were, they brought up, uh, factually, I mean, that's what you technically do. They brought up a hundred reasons why this class action is not to be certified, so to say, um, there's a different term in German. Um, but kind of the whole thing was, this is impossible and you can never sue Facebook. That was kind of the general argument. Um, you can't even go to courts against them. That is kind because of Because they're not competent. Um, no, the fun thing is, one of the things is the competence. Um, they've even argued that their own users are not competent to assign your claim because they're legally incompetent, which you can only be in Austria if you're going insane. Um, which is interesting because they claim 25,000 of their own users have apparently gone insane because um, obviously a couple of years earlier they were able to um, sign their privacy policy 
Um, so I was arguing if possibly Facebook makes you go insane, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a bunch of really interesting arguments. Um, it's really wonderful if you want to have a PR thing after that. You just take their own arguments, put it out to the media, and you have the best laugh ever. Um, and that's going to be very interesting because there we have the whole PRISM thing and NSA and um, big data in it as well. Um, so that has a high chance to go up to the ECJ at some point as well. Um, and what's interesting is what we did in that case, and that was legally really an interesting thing. And if any, I mean, I know a lot of company people are in here. If you have a um, uh, look at the terms you have, because um, what made the biggest fun for us was that they claimed that California law applies. And if you want to have torts, California law is the smartest thing you can possibly give your consumer. Um, and that's pretty much our argument we made in that case is that we say we have damages under um, Irish law because they're an Irish um, controller. We have a contract with an Irish company. So European data protection law applies. There's a cause of action in Article 20, 22 of the directive and then in Irish law. And this cause of action I can then use under California law to make a California tort claim. So we have a hybrid, we have a hybrid between European privacy law and California tort law, and it's only because of the terms of Facebook that we're able to do that. I was like, they have never had any, I mean, they pretty much took a California terms and translated it to German and thought that's, that's workable in Europe, um, which is wonderful if you do that, because you, as a consumer in Europe, you can kind of pick the jurisdiction you, that are, is more favorable to you. I can choose Austrian jurisdiction or California, and whatever the case is, I take the jurisdiction makes more fun. Or in Usually, your case, both. Yeah, in that case, you even have that hybrid situation. Um, and you can file the whole thing in Austria, so you're out of Dublin. <laughs> and so I was like, that's wonderful. And that was the only reason why we actually did the class action. I, I'm through with Facebook. I personally don't care about Facebook as a company or anything. I also kind of threw with the privacy debate. Um, but that class action and how the law worked together that well was like, I have to file it. There's no worry we're not doing that. Um, if you want to know more about the class action, all our files, also the class action is on our webpage to download. It's kind of interesting how we argued it legally. The other thing we also argued was unjust enrichment, which I think is going to be a, a new path you can take, um, saying that they un uh, like illegally use our data um, and make a certain amount of money off of it, which is like kind of the typical thing of unjust enrichment in most jurisdictions. Um, and that's kind of an interesting path to go down as well to get a monetary claim. Um, of course, in the case of Facebook, it's gonna be a couple of cents per user, so not really the big bucks. But the interesting thing is under Austrian procedural law is they have to come up with the number of how much money they're making on each user, which is gonna be very interesting to ask. <laughs> and um, I was already talking to privacy people said they're gonna have a, a, a Firefox ticker that tells you how much money they're making right now when you're on Facebook <laughs> um, with that information. And that was kind of the class action, which is kind of interesting, I think, as well, because it's taken really kind of um, consumer rights together with privacy and kind of mixes it in a way you really have something that's enforceable for an individual consumer, but also for consumer groups. And that's, I think, something that we'll see very likely in the future, that we have more consumer action, like really consumer groups that take, um, that take the lead. We do have that a little bit in Germany right now, that um, Verbraucherverband has gone after Facebook. Um, and we do have that a little more. I think what we need in the long run from an enforcement perspective is to have a European enforcement NGO, like something on a European level that really does what we did um, on a structural level. Because we right now, I mean, we did a lot on Facebook, um, and that was just from my home laptop. Like, that's really nothing. That's not a structure and nothing like that. Um, where you see how vulnerable they are in the end. Um, and I think that is the last thing I still want to do is kind of set up this European enforcement agency to kind of dump the knowledge we acquired so far into like, I call it the shoebox that should then happily flow on ever, ever after. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, you've, you've obviously garnered a lot of support. I mean, you were saying how pleased you were that they actually, the European Parliament is mm. coming uh, down on your side. Um, I mean, this comes back to sort of cultural differences between the US and the EU, and we're told that we must protect data flows at all costs. Yeah. What do you see as the fundamental differences? Um, it's interesting because I was an exchange student when I was 17 in the US in really the most redneck rural places in central Florida. Um, my host dad had a pump gun underneath his bed. It was wonderful. Um, but you really understand what, it helps me a lot to understand the US side. Um, and I think a lot, the, a lot of the troubles we have is that they're just two different cultures 
that are so deep, deep down in our souls that we can hardly express it, that are just clashing oftentimes. I see, see that also like on, on the European-US debate um, pol um, in politics a lot. Um, and I think that is kind of the key for me is that I'm happily understanding the US side and I just asked them to understand the European side as well if you do business here. And I think that's kind of the crucial thing we have to come to because we're right now more in, oftentimes in the debate of trying to um, kind of convince the other side of our point of view instead of trying to cooperate in a way. Um, and that was, I think, probably on the long run something that's going to be interesting and, and that I oftentimes see even with US officials that just have a hard time to understand the concept of fundamental rights in Europe because, um, and a lot of it is really not legal but cultural in the background. Um, so we're just re-talking from different sides. We even have that within Europe, like to Scandinavia, um, also like UK, Ireland, that sometimes has really different views on that. And I think that is oftentimes not really expressed too much um, and, and could overcome a lot of these issues. But I don't know if that goes down different. your question. <laughs> <laughs> and do you think it's different though versus who's actually getting access to the data? So for example, maybe we have more of a tolerance if uh, government or, or mm. if in the US the NSA is getting access to your data, but we're suddenly concerned if it's, if it's a corporate money-making entity. I mean, do you, think, do you see differences between government and corporates in that sense? I don't see that difference anymore because what we see in reality, and that's typically PRISM, is that we have corporations going after our data for monetary reasons, but then the government coming in and say, oh, you have all these nice data, let's get it. I mean, that's the Microsoft case with, which we have in the US right now where they have the warrants. Um, and that's a real big issue because um, you don't really have the separation anymore. You don't have the government spying on you. You have kind of Google on your phone that spies on you well enough, and then the government is taking it up. Um, and that's something why I don't really care about government and private that much anymore. Um, because in the end, if the government wants to access something that's on a private server, they're going to get it one way or the other, either they hack into the system if it's the NSA or they do Pfizer and PRISM and whatever um, and get it that way. Um, and therefore, there is a certain argument not to have your data. I mean, it's, it's typical things like I was at a conference in Washington and you have the 4S on your boarding pass where it says secondary security scanning scheme. Um, you pulled out because you're on the list. And if you ask Austrian Airlines, they tell you to get that from the Department of Homeland Security and they have to pull you out and that whole stuff. Um, and that's usually something where you never really know where the data comes from. I think in that case, it was the PNR data. Um, but it's kind of interesting to see how this kind of melts together, um, even from the CCTV that is usually run privately, but then the police is accessing it. We have the same thing on big scale as well. Okay, to come back to uh, Facebook again then. Um, you know, this, this is where it all started. I mean, in, in 2012, Facebook changed the privacy policy. Do you think that was in reaction to what you were doing? Um, we had a couple of changes on Facebook. They had to have shorter retention periods, which is interesting because, again, we, are not, we don't have access to the files, so we know there was pretty much no retention period or very long retention periods. And now they have a shorter one, which no one is allowed to know how long it is. Um, and we had the facial recognition that they had to turn off. Um, interestingly, Irish procedure again, they urged Facebook to do that on a consent basis, even though the Article 29 working group has found in the paper previously that facial recognition on social networks is disproportionate, which was Facebook, don't do it, um, just like in a abstract term, um, but it was totally targeting Facebook. And again, in Ireland, it was not enforced, but happily asked if they would be so nice to comply with that and not do it anymore. So um, in the end, the result was that they finally turned off the facial recognition thing. Our main argument was that it's totally disproportionate because you save two clicks if you mark someone on a picture and therefore you have facial recognition and bi biometric data of one billion people that's kind of slightly disproportionate possibly. Um, and there were new privacy policies twice, um, but factually from a legal perspective, they were a little easier to read um, from a consumer perspective, um, from a, from, but from a legal perspective, they're just the same policy. I mean, what we have with most of U US companies is that they have their policy written up under California law, because um, that's the US privacy policy law and then you just translate it to German. The problem is mainly that you have such abstract um, purposes that you can pretty much do anything. Like the, right, the old privacy policy that they just changed last week or something, um, was we use your information to pro try to provide this, um, the services and functions to you and others, which is the purpose of Facebook, which means you can do anything with the data, because anything you can possibly do as a company is a 
service and function you provide to you and others. <laughs> and, uh, um, and that is the, that is just where you see that the, they never really make a, I mean, it was one of our main arguments that the consent is invalid because if that's the purpose, it's very likely not specific, informed and unambiguous. Um, and uh, they just have this different approach where you still have the feeling that things are drafted in the Silicon Valley and then it's kind of the Europeans are just gonna get it and that's it, <laughs> don't worry for the European law. And that's really something where I was wondering how little the, um, how little companies are investing into being, um, being, complicit, uh, being compliant with European Union law. It's still something that's off the scale. I think the, um, the, the, um, the new penalties on, on the new regulation will bring it up because um, honestly in my university in California next door we had European um, with European competition law after the Microsoft case. So suddenly it was important because there was money in it. Right now we have the problem that you actually, it doesn't pay off to be compliant right now. Um, and that is something that a lot of Europeans don't understand because this idea of just looking at the law as a risk factor, which is just very much there in the US, is just not that much there in Europe. And that's something where it is kind of this, why are they not sticking to our law? And it was like, yes, because there's no fine. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, so I think that would help a lot in, in the new regulation. Um, and I hope that that's gonna get us somewhere closer to compliance. Okay, well, I'm, I'm looking, we're out of time already and I, we haven't even touched on the, the new regulation and the risk-based approach and, and all this <laughs> other stuff that I had written down. But there is another chance to hear Max this afternoon, so hopefully you'll be able to cover some of the things we didn't get round to. And I think that's it for this session. I think it's lunch next.